Um, I'm Martha Bayless. Uh, I teach at uh, Boston College, and I wrote a book two years back. Can you hear me? Is this microphone for tec technological reasons? Okay. Um, I published a book a few years back, which spends half of the book looking at the impact of American popular music, popular culture on the world, um, and the other half looking at public diplomacy, and trying to draw connections between them. And I should say my intellectual approach is that of a, what I like to call a vernacular critic, in the sense that rather than approaching these topics academically, I approach them as, um, as, a, as a movie critic, a TV critic, a music critic, um, for a general readership. And that's always been my tone and my approach um, for what that's worth. <coughs> um, my work on public diplomacy to get to the subject here is primarily based on interviews with practitioners uh, rather than with academic literature on the subject. When I started my project, it wasn't, I don't even think the academic field was as big as it is now. Um, and I didn't come at it from a more an academic perspective so much as someone who was trying to find out how, these, how this stuff worked. So I interviewed a lot of um, practitioners, got to know a lot of practitioners. And my book, all of my book is really primarily based on interviews for what that's worth. Um, but I say this because my stance here is, um, some is more sympathetic and supportive of U.S. efforts, public diplomacy and so forth, than perhaps some an academic analysts tend to be. So I guess my first comment would be to say, since my topic is public diplomacy, U.S. public diplomacy in the Middle East region or the MENA region, um, the first and most salient fact, which I'm sure I don't have to point out to this group, is that those who think of this in terms of the Cold War, particularly U.S. public diplomacy in the former in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and so forth, the big contrast, obvious contrast, is I put it this way: in the Cold War period, there were friendly people and a hostile government, and in this uh, Middle East region for U.S. public diplomacy, it's more like a friendly government and a hostile people because of the U.S. supporting so many autocratic governments over the years that our attempts to defend democracy and talk about American values have often fallen on relatively hostile or deaf ears because we are the government that's not on the side of democracy in, in many countries historically. I remember trying to explain this to a group of my freshmen at Boston College, and one student, having never given it much thought when he learned that the U.S. had supported autocratic governments in the Middle East, this was some years ago, his response was to go, no! <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it is true. So I'll just give a quick overview of my sense of how the U.S. has conducted public diplomacy in this region. Um, and then I'll focus in a little bit on music, because I know that's what you're talking about. Um, and I think what I'm saying has some pertinence to your topic. Um, <coughs> and I want to go back just briefly to the time before 9-11 and the U.S. military interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq, and uh, talk about what was the kind of public diplomacy that was most effective, most uh, emulated, uh, and I recommend a book by uh, a man named William Rue, who was a veteran Arabist. Um, he was one of the few people who came up through the U.S. International uh, Agency, USIA, Interna U.S. In US in Information Agency, sorry, USIA, um, who also became an ambassador. He was ambassador to the Emirates and also to Yemen at one point. He's a very old man now. But he wrote a very pedestrian you know, a practitioner's history of what went on. And I really recommend it. It's called American Encounters with Arabs. And what I like about it <coughs> is he describes what the public diplomat did in the Arab world for, for much of our history there, which was simply to show up, 
um, try to articulate America's ideals, its interests, and its intentions in the region uh, in a truth-based way, not to engage in deceptive propaganda, um, obviously an effort to persuade, but not to propagandize, and then to take the flack, to take all the questions, that many of which would be hostile, critical, and so forth, but just to stand there and try genially and generously to answer people's questions. And there were several people who were very, very good at this, and the U.S. did this for a long time. Uh, even bef it, it got harder after 1967, obviously. Uh, the flak got a little bit thicker after the U.S. began more assertively to support Israel in the region. And, of course, it differed a lot in different countries. And in some countries, which, um, not Arab countries, but some countries where we should have been doing it, we didn't do it. I would say strikingly not in Turkey. This was never a, an American <laughs> practice in Turkey, which mystifies me. We could talk about that. We didn't really do it in Saudi <coughs> either. We did it in places where America had older ties, notably Lebanon, Egypt, and so forth. I can say more about it. At its best, this kind of taking the flak public appearances in person, not on television, sometimes on television, but in person. Television was not a big item, of course, during this time. Cultural centers, American-style libraries where people could go in and freely borrow materials, not just materials about America, but materials in all languages. And that also provided safe gathering places for debates and public forums that could not really be held anywhere else. And the high point of this was probably the U.S. Embassy and Cultural Center in Cairo, which was legendary. It had a garden cafe, and it was a real attractive meeting place. Then came the end of the Cold War, and as I'm sure you all know, that brought a sense of triumphalism where Americans decided, well, we don't need to pay for this anymore. Everybody loves us. Uh, and the various public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy efforts were cut very broadly and roughly by about a third. And in 1999, the USIA, known as USIS overseas, was eliminated. Uh, and I would argue, and I have argued in my book, that in this same triumphalism was a preference for the private sector private sector had the answers. You know, they were, the, they were the, the witches and the warlords and the others were muggles. You know, the government people, am I getting that right? Government people were muggles <laughs> and the others were sorcerers and witches. So the private sector had the magic. So basically handed over the job of representing the United States to the commercial media. You can even see this in Frank Fukuyama's famous essay where he talks at the beginning about television and, you know, consumer products as if we were joined at the hip with political uh, freedoms and it, it's just, uh, there was the whole package for him. He simps changed his mind. Then came a very disruptive and transformative technology. And I don't mean the internet. I mean satellite television. Um, there has been satellite television around since the 80s but in the 90s, it took off with free-to-air satellite channels, most famously Al Jazeera, of course, in 96, um, which did not focus on culture, but of course on news. And we c I could say more about Al Jazeera. Um, and that brought a lot of... Um <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I hate people who pop into the microphone, so I was... My scarf rustled. Will you have a problem? Okay. You want me to start over? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the audience wants me to start. Okay. <clears throat> so that the satellite television brought a, a, a flood of um, American entertainment, and not the best American entertainment, because of course all these new satellite channels wanted to buy something that was cheap. So for a brief moment, the, the soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful, was the most popular television pro program in the world, just by sheer numbers. And so popular culture in America at the time was pretty 
pretty raunchy, pretty violent, and it was, you know, served up in large servings by this new medium to lots of places in the world that had very little previous exposure to the United States. And my argument was that this was a shock to the system and did not do the United States any favors, taken as a whole. Um, and in the, in the Middle East, of course, this was particularly true. So I won't go on about that right now. Then came 9-11 and this sudden question, why do they hate us? <coughs> which President Bush famously asked, which is a question revealing of how naive our triumphalism had been and also how lacking we were in ideas for how to respond. So I'll briefly summarize. By our first response <coughs> in terms of public diplomacy was to fight the last war. We reached back to the Cold War use of music, broadcast music, um, the use of jazz on Voice of America, very famously in, the, in uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Soviet Union. And then the non-state influence of the 60s counterculture, rock music and all that, which filtered into the Soviet sphere very, very effectively undermined those regimes by appealing to the youth, most famously in Czechoslovakia, where a little band called the Plastic People of the Universe uh, steadfastly refused to stop playing despite orders from the uh, Czech government. This was after the 68 invasion and won the uh, sympathy and approval of Václav Havel and became heroes of the Velvet Revolution. And they had taken their title from the American rock musician Lou Reed. So that was a big chapter. So, gee, they love our, they hate us, but they love our popular music seems to have been the calculus. They being a somewhat vague concept since we've gone from Eastern Europe to the Middle East. <coughs> So um, the U.S. international broadcasting system, which included Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and by now Radio Free Asia, decided it had to beef up its Arabic language service. And the strongest governor of that system was a commercial radio guy named Norman Pattis, who was the CEO of a big uh, format pop music radio network called Westwood One. And he decided that he knew the answer. And that what he would do was propose a new model of US public diplomacy, which would be a radio station playing Arab and American pop music. I'm, you've probably all heard of Radio Sawa. Is that correct? As, who's heard of Radio Sawa? OK. <coughs> well, OK, well then I'll. Hmm? And Westwood One, too. Yeah, <laughs> OK. Um, the memory of Radio Sawa seems to have faded, but it's Radio Sawa is actually still in operation. Radio Sawa, those of you who speak Arabic, and maybe I'm mispronouncing it, it means together, radio together. And they played British and, um, and, uh, and um, Arabic pop music. And uh, it was pretty popular at first because um, there was no real competition for that at the time. Uh, but nobody seriously asked if, a, if an infusion of pop music was the solution to the Islamist ra radicalization of Arab youth. And I know an American diplomat, a very fine Arabist, who was there for many years, and she said to me uh, when this was going on, young Egyptians feel disappointed when Americans reach out to them only as consumers. They don't crave iPods. This was back in the days of iPods. Um, they crave serious contact. <coughs> and she told an anecdote about being at a rock concert in Cairo, talking to some of the young people in the audience. And she asked them, are you enjoying the concert? And they said, yeah, but we'd rather talk to you. She spoke very good Arabic, Egyptian Arabic. Um, now, Christine was kind enough to footnote my argument about pop culture being uh, fueling existing hostility to the US. Um, and I'll just quickly go back to that topic and say that some of it's easy to understand. Raunchy sex, grisly violence, uh, drug use, alcohol, the celebration of crime, all those things that offend socially and religiously conservative people every, in every society, even in ours before the recent election, <coughs> where now socially conservative people in America seem to have extended the limits of their tolerance to all sorts of offensive behavior, but I won't go into that. <coughs> um, but then there's other things I learned in my travels. 
um, which I could go into, but I'm not sure it's particularly relevant right now. And I don't, I'm, how am I doing for time? Nobody's, okay. Um, I, could, I could, if you're interested, tell you some of the things I learned in my travels that were not so obvious as, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or sex, drugs, and violence. Um, I will. <laughs> okay, well, well, one of the things that I, that I would not have noticed until I went and talked to a lot of other people around the world was the portrayal of U.S. political and social institutions in our entertainment is incredibly cynical and dark. And we like it that way because we're very critical of our government and we're very critical of our institutions and we love seeing them represented in this Kafka-esque way. But if you're overseas and you don't know much about the United States, you tend to take it literally. And you tend to think, well, it's no better than my government. And this has been made good use of in China, for example. Um, deliberate use of in China. It's no accident that China allowed the distribution on Weibo of um, House of Cards when it first came out. And when President Xi came to the United States a few years ago, he was making a speech in Seattle, and someone asked him whether his anti-corruption campaign was a was an attempt to eliminate his political rivals. And he said, oh no, he said, this is no house of cards. <laughs> and everybody erupted in delighted laughter. Oh, it's wonderful that the Chinese are watching house of cards. No, I don't think so, not so much. Because there are a lot of Chinese young people, and I, ha I get this through my gr various grapevines, who think really, well, house of cards is what, there's a lot wrong with the United States government, don't get me wrong, and it's functioning, but house of cards is not about that. And it's, that's just one example. Um, and then, of course, there's, the, there's our obsession with extreme violence, extreme graphic violence, which is a very troubling uh, thing. Uh, for example, going back to the Middle East, I'm sure you are all aware that violent jihadist groups have, like ISIS, have borrowed the style of first-person shooter video games as part of their recruitment efforts, and they copy the style of uh, some of our violent entertainment on their videos to sort of incite excitement and recruit uh, restless youth to the cause. The cutting edge of this, which I only read about recently, was the use of, um, now, I'll do a, now I'll do a generational leap here, VIOPOV recording. Now, half of you know what that is, and the other half don't. Um, it's vo video input output point of view recording. In other words, like the camera that the policemen wear. Could somebody close the door? Um, you wear a camera that's recording your, uh, your point of view while you're committing a violent act. And ISIS, uh, I think, has attempted to adopt this as it gets more and more miniaturized and less and less expensive, it's more and more widespread. So you can see the torture, you can see the beheadings through the eyes of the torturer and the man with the ax. And this is also distributed. I, I don't really know how effective this is as a recruitment, but it's a, it's a way of uh, getting attention, that's for sure. Now the irony, of course, is that the same thing was done by the shooter in New Zealand. And that he uploaded, he found ways to upload his video before the the fang, you know, the mainstream platforms could be could scrub it. So it's out there. Uh, if you know how to get at it, if you go to 8chan or some of these darker corners of the internet, you can watch that happening through the eyes of the guy who was doing it. So um, that's another influence, which I'm not going to lay totally at the feet of the video game industry, but I will lay some of it there although certainly human beings are capable of mayhem and violence without any help from the video game industry. This all raises the question of what would effective cultural diplomacy or even public diplomacy mean in today's world, especially for the US and the Middle East? Um, so let me just quickly introduce a term that uh, Christine didn't use in her paper, but I think is relevant. It was coined by the National Endowment for Democracy a couple of years ago in a, paper, a report they did, which I recommend, called Sharp Power and Rising Authoritarian Influence. Have you all heard of sharp power? You must have heard of it. Sharp power is the new S word before power. Ru Walter Russell Mead tried sticky, sweet, that didn't catch on. 
Then we had Joseph Nye going back to smart. Um, but this is sharp, sharp power. They define it as turning away from soft power, which works through attraction and persuasion, and toward sharp power, which pierces, penetrates, or perforates. This is very alliterative. Um, the political and information environments in the targeted countries. And the report is worth reading. It's a case-by-case -case analysis of four fragile democracies, none of them in the Middle East. Argentina, Peru, Poland, and Slovakia. Um, so sharp power is in circulation, particularly as applied to Russia and to China. It, imp it means a kind of, and it's the sort of thing Christine will talk about, kind of a, a sort of information warfare with a, with a sharp edge. <laughs> Um, really, and also getting into institutions and, and, and politicizing institutions and using institutions to expand your influence in a very aggressive way. Um, in the case of China, it's more like uh, engaging in aggressive, in, I'm quoting, aggressive investment, co-optation, and dishonest salesmanship, while at the same time masking its policies and suppressing, and very intent on suppressing voices beyond China's borders that are critical of the Chinese Communist Party. On the Russian side, it's more the, the, play, the, the role of the spoiler. Um, uh, instead of trying to convince the world, again, I'm quoting, that its autocratic system is appealing in its own right, it seeks to level the playing field largely by dragging down its democratic adversaries. Um, I think what's going on now in public diplomacy is there are a lot of people coming to the issue who haven't, who aren't very aware of its history, and they feel like conventional methods are old hat. We need to do something new. We need to beef it up. We need to supercharge it. And often they reach for these, they don't know it, but they're reaching for sharp power. And I'm worried about that, frankly. I think sharp power is a bad thing because it's deceptive, it's manipulative, and it tends to recoil upon the user in the long run, I hope, and I, it, that's what's happened in the past. What, do, what can we do then? My last little bit, I will say, we need to go back to something that's more truth-based. I know truth is a quaint and antique concept, but I do think we need to go back to something truth-based. And I've come to focus in my current work on the news media. I don't say a whole lot about my news media in my book. I have the chapter on broadcasting. but. The best of our international broadcasting, now it's called media, Voice of America, RFERL, RFA, these are old terms. There are still some services, language services of that system, which is a big system, uh, that are still modeling and providing good journalism in places where good journalism does not exist. Um, this has not been done in the Middle East. Along with Radio Sawa, what happened in the Middle East after 9-11, was the, there was the creation of a television channel, another satellite television channel, in a region glutted with television channels, called uh, Al Hura. How many of you have heard of Al Hura? OK. <laughs> um, less successful than Radio Sawa. Um, attract the youth with the, oh, OK. Um, Al Hura mainly used, um, it used wire service reports for news, and when it was asked to do m more news and less music, it added more wire service news. And now they've added some other things, but Al Hura has never really been able to get off the ground for lots of reasons. It was a crowded field. They made some really dumb mistakes in the first year or two, and they just haven't been able to gain any traction. And now, of course, Al Hura is widely known as the American channel that never gained any traction. So it's both widely known and ignored. There's a new director, a former public diplomat, for whom I have quite a lot of respect. I can't exactly tell you what he's doing, because I'm, I'm not up to speed on it, but it's a subject that I'm very interested in. So let me just end, I keep ending, but <laughs> one more point. Of all the kind of news reporting, news reporting as a, good news reporting as a form of public diplomacy, is something that I think is very important in the world now, and perhaps should even be a, a priority, given our own news environment. We have to sort of relearn what it means. But I'll say this. 
there's one kind of news reporting that I think is guaranteed to be successful. It's the most costly and the most difficult. And it's what uh, the old system calls surrogate news reporting, which means on the ground, in the language, local and regional news reporting in places where this does not exist. Now of course, the United States is a place where this barely exists. We should start at home. <coughs> but even Al Jazeera, when it started, Al Jazeera was extremely effective, mainly because it was reporting on CNN style on the ground about things that no other Arab channel was reporting. And this, would, this was the main reason for its success, that and the fact that it was staffed largely by refugees from BBC who knew what they were doing. <coughs> it's expensive, and in places like Syria, it's so dangerous it's practically impossible. But you're dealing in the Middle East with a, with a viewership who are tired of the satellite so-called news channels, which have become very, very sectarian, very nationalistic, very biased. Even Al Arabiya, who, for which I used to have more respect, is now placed more under the direct control of MSB. <coughs> it's, I, I don't speak Arabic, so I'm, it, I have to rely on all my friends who speak Arabic. <coughs> to tell me about this, but <coughs> it's become very polarized, a little bit like our cable TV channels. And people don't, they just don't trust it. And they're not as drawn to it as they were. And so in a way, there's an opening there for, to do it right. <sighs> Will the present administration get that? I don't think so. <coughs> but I think it's, it's definitely worth a try. Um, we might have to start by fixing our own journalistic house and then try supporting it and perhaps exporting it into places where it might gain some, r regain some re respect for the United States and what the United States stands for. Thank you. This thing, would this help? No, it's not powerful. Oh. There's nothing loose. <coughs> this is why I don't use PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to try to maybe advance here. So, actual events. Uh, the Eurovision the upcoming Eurovision Song Contest, and how we might be able to analyze it in the context of culture here. Oh, the microphone. Oh. <laughs> okay, culture. I was going to make some sotto voce comments <laughs> that everybody could hear. Okay, how's this? Okay, all right. Okay, so how can we con um, analyze the Eurovision, the current Eurovision Song context, uh, Contest in the context of cultural diplomacy um, and also um, in the context of Israeli um, policy in increasingly looking towards uh, cultural diplomacy as a way of presenting themselves and on the other hand having uh, Palestinian calls for cultural boycott. And so, okay. right, so what interests me here is really what made me interested particularly was this exuberant reaction to Neta Barzilai's win last year in the Eurovision. And um, so before we go any further, right, I should probably say a few words about the Eurovision Song Contest. And I, I'm going to say more, and I'm going to have some pictures. But um, just in case you're not familiar with it, right, it's the annual uh, competition amongst European Broadcasting Union members. 
and um, it's a very kitschy, campy, glittery pop extravaganza, um, which also is used by countries um, for nation branding, for presenting themselves to the world either um, through their folkloristic musical traditions and, and costumes, um, or to, to present themselves to the world as a modern Western European country. It's a big deal in Europe and beyond. And um, Israel won last year. And um, this that means that this year um, it has the right to host this year's competition. And so then the competition is going to be in May. Um, so besides having this, re the, you know, having, a, um, having uh, a motivation and excuse to follow this year's competition really closely, I also am interested in this because it brings to head Israeli attempts um, to project a positive image to the world through cultural events and hosting cultural events, and on the other side, having Palestinian, pro-Palestinian allies, um, you know, like trying to uh, popularize a boycott of Israel also in the cultural sphere. Um, and so how this fight plays out is my, my case study. And um, I have some initial hunches, right, seeing that it, it definitely is giving the BDS movement, a uh, platform that uh, it might not have had before. Um, we can see a lot of the current media uh, coverage um, is even non-political, uh, you know, non-political stories about the Eurovision Song Contest now talk a lot about uh, BDS, like towards audiences that may have not been aware of it before. Um, okay, so, right, so, okay. All right, so, um, Hosting a big international cultural event is an important part of cultural diplomacy, or like the idea of nation branding, right? States projecting a specific image um, as a modern state, open-minded state, open for business state. I mean, if you think about um, the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and how um, the Chinese government was presenting itself to the world, there you get an idea of, you know, like of the, the kind of possibilities that are there. Um, right. So in conflict situation, cultural diplomacy is usually touted as a means of overcoming conflict, of building bridges. Um, and um, so the tagline for the U.S. State Department's Division of, Cul uh, of Education and Cultural Division is uh, promoting international, uh, promoting mutual understanding, right? So the idea is that presenting each other presenting your culture to other countries is going to um, help you overcome, help overcome conflict, bring people closer to each other. Um, but while cultural diplomacy is officially that and can be really helpful there, um, it is also, but it can become another confrontation, another area of confrontation. And so if you think about the, um, the Cold War cultural diplomacy Martha was mentioning, Right, like yes, that was officially um, these programs of exchange and sending your cu cultural groups into the Soviet Union or Soviet cultural groups to the U.S. were about were supposed to be initiatives of to further international understanding. It was also this um, not very underhanded way of like a part of the struggle for cultural supremacy, right, and and winning hearts and minds and so on. So in asymmetric conflicts between a government and you know, opposition groups or non-state actors, um, we can see that the weaker party, like the especially militarily weaker party, might use some of these cultural diplomacy or like public diplomacy mm -hmm. in a way to try to get an advantage that they otherwise don't have, right? Like they, um, they're trying to reach out to governments through NGOs and, and others to um, and call it, um, you know, political um, international intervention in a conflict, for example. Um, so by rallying international public opinion, um, public uh, to one's cause, groups are hoping that um, they can extract concessions from their conflict, uh, you know, from the other party in the conflict. Um, so one example there is um, the or often used example is the fight against apartheid in South Africa. Right, where um, foreign public opinion actually had co real consequences for the government. Um, so in this fight against apartheid, NGOs lobbied their governments to sever ties with the South African government. 
and um, led consumer boycotts, instigated exclusion of South Africa from Olympic events and, and, you know, and, and other uh, sports events. And um, so these efforts are said to have um, contributed, you know, certainly they didn't lead to the end of apartheid, but they have contributed to, um, you know, a shift in public opinion, undermining the, um, the legitimacy of, of uh, the South African regime at the time. Um, right, so before I get into the Palestinian boycott of Israel in the asymmetric conflict there, I have a few words on Israel's external relations and how they use um, a culture there as well. So the official Israeli government line um, regarding culture is very similar to other nations as well, right? Like culture is presented as a bridge builder meant to create positive relations uh, with other countries. And spe specifically, cultural diplomacy is presented as an important part of Israel's, uh, well, like of, yeah, of the, the, of the peace process mm -hmm. with um, Israel's Arab neighbors. Right? But researchers and practitioners um, alike, um, alike find have complained that Israel public diplomacy and you know, like an extension also the cultural aspects of that, in fact, um, don't provide mm -hmm. enough necessary resources to ha be effective there. And um, so I have, the number here is not current, right? 2006 is a study of Israeli public diplomacy that found that Israel was at that point spending $9 million annually on public diplomacy and um, Gilbar was you know, like complaining that that wasn't enough. Um, in the paper there are some numbers from a European, um, like a European paper that I found, a well, European report which cannot be true, they're so low, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, so I <laughs> decided to maybe revisit that. Mm -hmm. um, but so this $9 million a year, in the US we have about $2 billion a year right now and sometimes we complain that that's not enough. Um, but it, it compared to the money that is put towards uh, fighting the growing BDS movement um, in Israel, we can see that there is like a, you know, like that, that, that um, this probably is not a lot of money to um, present a very positive view here of Israel, a positive sides of Israel. Mm -hmm. So the amount uh, dedicated to the fight of the BDS movement, uh, some numbers that I've seen is here like 15 million dollars uh, since 2015 or like there's a report that since 2017 there were um, 72 million dollars allocated both to um, through ministerial funds but also NGOs and donors and so on so certainly a lot of money that seems to be allocated to try if in the Israeli government um, so what are they you know fighting against um, this is like the, the BDS movement. I probably don't have to say too much about this right here. Um, and we can get back to that if you have more questions. But part of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel um, is the call for cultural uh, boycotts, right? Discouraging international artists from performing in Israel um, or discouraging foreigners to participate in uh, you know, from in to, to, to travel to Israel for cultural events are, you know, all part of the cultural boycotts. Um, so the BDS movement claims that Israel is, you know, like depending on what, what event you're talking about, art washing, maybe the occupation, right? Like trying to um, <coughs> distract from human rights violations against Palestinians um, or uh, by, by, you know, like presenting um, a more, you know, like liberal, uh, a more liberal, uh, you know, like um, character than its surrounding neighbors and and things like that, right? Okay, so this brings us to the Eurovision Song Contest, right? So I mentioned that it's uh, the European Broadcasting Union organized it since 1956. The EBU has uh, 73 members from 56 countries. They're not all in Europe. I mean, clearly we're talking about Israel here, um, but. The majority of countries um, is located in Europe, and initially it really has was seen as something that would bring the countries of this newly developing European community together, right? In a very, at least that was the idea, very apolitical way, right? Um, so participating organizations choose national representatives, like usually in a televised competition, and then they send them to the finals. Um, which are traditionally held in last winners, um, you know, like the last winners' home country. 
Um, and so then the countries are like the um, selections happen both through a jury that is made up of um, music industry officials, but also um, people can vote, you know, through text message, phone calls, and app right now. So it's also definitely mm -hmm. a, a public popularity contest that is going on. Right, so you can't really do this justice without sounds, right? But I do at least have some photos, right? So um, many states use the international stage for nation branding. And you sometimes you wonder what kind of nation they're trying to present, especially like <laughs> up to the right, this Finnish entry from a few years ago is really scary. Um, but so a lot of, so some of them have like these, you know, more traditional elements, like in the corner there, and others are like this, which some people call hyper-modern expression of what your state is supposed to be, right? Like presenting themselves as, as diverse, as Western, as uh, socially liberal, um, and you know, like being, being part of this community there. Um, and so I want to jump over this, but because there is a lot of politics in the Eurovision, and we can talk about that maybe if you have questions later. Um, so there's like a whole research program now, right? That, that's like built around the politics of Eurovision, the voting, the songs, the, you know, the national brand, na nation branding as well. Um, okay, so, but one thing that, that I should say like that boycotts are certainly common, right? Like, or, or d do happen occasionally, let's put it that way. So Arab states, for example, that could totally be part of this um, have not participated since Israel joined and, and has participated. Um, uh, we also have other cases like Austria uh, boycotting Franco-Spain or Greece boycotting Turkey. So you definitely have like world politics playing out during the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, all right, so Israel has participated since 1973 and won three times. And so the one example of nation branding um, like kind of open nation branding that Israel that, that I came across uh, was in 2009 when Israel's entry was partially in Arabic, was performed by a Jewish Israeli singer together with an Arab Israeli singer. Um, the song itself emphasized like, the common humanity and coexistence and, um, and was chosen to express aspirations for coexistence. Right? So that's something in, in other cases it might have been more inadvertently like Dana International uh, won as the first transgender entry, um, entry or was the first transgender uh, winner, but um, I'm not sure how, you know, like how, like th there was like a mixed reception of that in Israel itself. Um, all right, so following past victories, um, Israel has held the competitions in Jerusalem, but this year that worked out a little differently. All right, so 2008, right, before the final in Lisbon, Netta Brazilai was packed as the winner by gambling companies, and there's a lot of gambling around the Eurovision in Europe as well. 2018, uh, 18, sorry, 2018, right. Um, so, so before the competition, right, like the, we could already see this, this fight starting between BDS proponents and, um, you know, like in more pro-Israeli advocacy organizations here. So we have here the so that's like uh, the the competition was in Portugal that year. So like some local organizations were trying to, you know, call on people to boycott um, Netta's participation, um, while um, pro like the more advocacy organizations um, here, the Digital Ambassador Club of the World Jewish Congress called on their members to actually go out and you know vote for Netta and make sure that um, she would you know end you know high, and so she did win. Right, um, and Israel celebrated, right? Like it's like sort of, looks like a World Cup win or something. Toys, toys that was the name of her, her, her song. Um, so many politicians from president to prime minister expressed their joy in tweets, statements, and impromptu chicken dances that we saw, we saw earlier. Um, but it soon became clear that for politicians particularly, it wasn't so much, it was to a certain extent, yes, they see um, Neta, you know, like winning as a as a win for Israel, and they said that. But they also um, were even more excited that now they had an opportunity to host this year's uh, competition, right? So Netanyahu, for example, tweeted, "The gift was that Eurovision will be coming to Jerusalem next year, right?" Um, Israeli public figures started to tie together this win and the opportunity to have the the competition. 
um, with the almost simultaneously move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, because it both happened in May. So one of the ministers said, Netan Barzilai and a new embassy next year in Jerusalem, right? So like all these, like of course also using next year in Jerusalem as a, you know, like as a, as a rallying cry here. Um, right, so the Eurovision in Jerusalem became um, a part of the government's campaign for global recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, right? Um, the co problem, of course, of course, was that Jerusalem is not universally recognized as the capital of Israel, and Palestinians and allies pushed back against um, Jerusalem's candidacy as a host city. Right. So in the end, the EBU decided um, on Tel Aviv as the host city, so that went through a bidding process. It's not officially a political decision, right? It's like they say that the best bid came from Tel Aviv. But it was a blow to some of Israeli's politicians, like some of the culture minister even had come out and said, if it's not in Jerusalem, we shouldn't host it at all, and then had to backpedal on that and say, okay, well, Tel Aviv is good too. Um, so BDS, the BDS movement had claim, claimed an early victory at that point, right? And they have really made the Eurovision or the boycotting the Eurovision a big campaign for 2019. Right, so after the contest is now not held in Jerusalem, it's not like they stopped then, but instead uh, the movement advocates against participating at all. So we have some examples here. Um, in Ireland, there were like a lot of uh, calls for boycott and some, um, you know, like I think the, the broadcasting organization actually had to come out and give a statement saying, okay, we are participating but any of our uh, employees who don't want to go to Israel don't have to. Um, in, I in Iceland, um, there were some people, some, some artists who decided not to participate in the national, um, you know, like national competitions because they said we, they wouldn't participate in, um, in Tel Aviv as well. Up to the right there, there's a photo, there's a protester that stormed the, who stormed the stage uh, during the Fr French um, national competition as well. So there's a lot, um, a lot of movement around this, right? A lot of activity, um, but not necessarily, you know, like it doesn't disrupt the actual, um, you know, like the, the week that is planned in, in Tel Aviv is probably not disrupted much for there. We see a lot of business as usual here, right? Like the, the event will be held in Tel Aviv, a lot of people will go and visit, um, I doubt that fewer people are going to watch than they used to in the past. Um, so on the surface, it's going to look like, you know, this is going to be a success for Israel, unless there are major disruptions, right, which we can't foresee right now. Um, but there's not a lot. No, no, no country has withdrawn or decided not to participate because, it, the, you know, like it, this is happening in Israel. Um, but on the other hand, um, we do see that even non-political coverage of the event um, includes information about the claims um, of the BDS movement, right? So even, I don't know, I, like I found like a TV guide website that was like, oh, where is the, you know, where's the Eurovision this year? Like a very simple question in a n very non-political mm -hmm. newspaper or news source that then says, well, good question, it's in Tel Aviv, it was supposed to be in Jerusalem, but it's not now, and that's because mm -hmm you know, like a lot of countries don't recognize Jerusalem and the Palestinians are claiming this. And so suddenly you have um, a, a lot of, you know, space for um, the claims of the boycott movement that we haven't seen before. And maybe even, you know, like reaching groups and reaching countries or reaching individuals who normally don't follow these, um, these events. And all right, so I will follow this, right? Like I will um, collect some numbers for visitors, for um, audience, for you know, like the voting, and so on, to see if there are any differences. Um, the larger implications that I want to end with is that I feel that we really have to acknowledge both as practitioners, but also uh, you know, as academics, um, that while culture and cultural diplomacy can be an important element of peace building and conflict resolution, um, that it can really exacerbate existing conflicts. And then also, so if you connect cultural achievement and the boycott thereof, right, like this is becoming a zero-sum game, right? Either Israel wins because Netta wins, 
Or then what happens if she loses? Then this would then also be a loss for Israel as a country. And we're talking about the Eurovision here, right? I mean, I'm not sure that it really should have that much importance. Most of the music, I mean, Toy is a great song. Most of the music is horrible, right? Um, and so <laughs> suddenly this is how this ties with your national you know, like status that seems um, kind of ridiculous. Right, and then second, so we do see then that in asymmetric conflicts like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, cultural warfare can level the playing field between, uh, you know, like at least in this one area between the government and the, um, you know, the weaker party, right? So Israeli government feels itself a little bit cornered here then saying, well, we try to counter the boycott movement, but by doing so, are we not actually putting more emphasis into that? Do we not give them more publicity? Do we not actually make this a more valuable, um, you know, like a valued uh, part of the conflict than, than it should be? All right, and that's it. <laughs> uh, today I'm gonna talk about the cultural diplomacy instruments and more generally soft power instruments deployed by the AKP government in contemporary Turkey. <coughs> uh, and firstly, uh, I would like to provide uh, a brief introduction to the national cultural policy uh, to explain what's going on in the domestic uh, front and to understand uh, the uh, implications of the cultural policy issues uh, in Turkey and its impact on the deterioration of the nation's image. And my argument is like the more the nation's image is deteriorated, the AKP government uh, deployed soft power instruments intensely and more expensively. Uh, the political, social and cultural and economic landscape has been radically uh, transformed. And uh, Turkey's position in the global order has changed significantly since 2013, after the Gezi Park protests especially. And until the 2010, uh, 10, uh, Turkey was perceived as the exemplar secular democratic state, and, and it was the primary marker in the nation, uh, nation's image. And but uh, like the political developments in the global world, the changes in the global economy, Arab, uh, Arab Spring, the Gezi Park protests, and AKP government's accelerated authoritarianism, uh, the attempt coup d'etat, the refugee crisis, increased terrorism, and social fragmentation accelerated the political uh, turmoil in the country and affected the nation's image even more, even worse. Um, uh, when we look at uh, national cultural policy, um, there are like four uh, trends has been going on. One of them is the quest for cultural hegemony. The AKP government uh, came into power with a solid political strategy, but the cultural dimension has always been existent uh, throughout its uh, throughout its power and uh, it's always just pursues a religious and uh, political agenda uh, through these cultural instruments through the cultural dimension uh, and the main aim is to inculcate a conservative way of life conservative values and norms uh, in the political social and economic landscape as well and the cultural policies uh, cannot be thought outside of this axis. And um, AKP government has always had the quest for cultural hegemony and which has been articulated by President Erdogan himself several times that they uh, have not succeeded in the field of uh, culture and education. Um, and uh, when you look at different case studies in uh, cultural policy, you just uh, see the trend in the conservatization of uh, arts and culture or the intention to inculcate conservative norms and values in uh, cultural policy. And like some of the examples might be the cultural policies like new directives uh, promulgated for the dissolution of the national cultural institutions, which has been a, like a uh, secular 
uh, Republican institutions and um, the AKP government through a new directive uh, had the intention to dissolution, to dissolute uh, the national cultural institutions and it also promulgated several laws and uh, directives like um, uh, integrating morality criteria for private private theaters for a private theater to be able to get funded they have to uh, accompany with the morality criteria and which is really highly vague and it's really difficult to define it or like uh, mm -hmm. the new article for the municipality theaters uh, they just ask they just want the theater place to protect the ethical values of the society and the conservative media really attacked the municipality theater which is one of the like oldest cultural institution and these kind of like issues created a fragmentation between cultural community and the AKP government and also like the demolition of Atatürk Cultural Center which is like a highly it's the uh, the big it was the biggest cultural center in Turkey and Istanbul it was located in Taksim Square it has a symbolic value and it has like a collect it's important for the collective memory of the Istanbulites and it is the meeting place and it was the it was demolished and of course the AKP government was cognizant of the importance of like raising another cultural center instead of this um, in terms of like the AKP legitimacy uh, and um, AKP pursues its like conservative and nationalist agenda aligning with its neo-Ottoman uh, focus uh, in the domestic uh, national cultural policies and it we also see its reflection in uh, soft power instruments or cu cultural diplomacy instruments as well. And when we look at we when we come to the international cultural relations, the international uh, international cultural like legal space, uh, there are like three important institutions: European Union, Council of Europe, and UNESCO. And Turkey has been has like long relationship with each of these institutions and this constitutes an important pillar of the cultural dimension of uh, Turkey's uh, cultural diplomacy and Turkey has uh, deployed cultural diplomacy instruments before the AKP government through like bilateral cultural relations and it was not new but the term cultural diplomacy has first been used during the AKP era um, and during the restructuring of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a new separate cultural unit is established within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for devoted for cultural diplomacy. And that is how the concept started to use uh, like after 2010. And when we look at the soft power instruments that's uh, deployed by the AKP government, uh, the first one is Yunus Emre Cultural Centers. In 2007, Yunus Emre Foundation was established to promote Turkey, its language, history, arts, and culture, and providing education on Turkish language, arts, and cultural fields, and uh, support cultural exchanges. And with within affiliation of the institute, there are many cultural centers established around the world uh, in like by 2017 I think there were 43 cultural centers and the content is highly controlled by the AKP government and this is the uh, government's um, cultural main cultural diplomacy instrument and very recently they start they will start a training program in order uh, for uh, for professionals who will be specialized on cultural diplomacy and with this I think I construe this as the AKP's intention to strengthen its uh, capacity it's the capacity building for cultural diplomacy as an effort to strengthen uh, capacity building um, and um, another instrument is uh, Turkish TV series uh, like Turkish TV series started as a like private initiative it was highly commercialized but it was just expanded unexpectedly and it's in the Middle East Africa Europe Balkans everywhere 
people were really interested in the drama series and uh, AKP <coughs> understood the effectiveness of these series and started to support these series and sometimes support them or sometimes commission uh, these TV series and one of them is uh, yeah, this Sasham Suleiman and it was um, it was a, like a Latin American version and uh, in uh, its neo-Ottoman vision the AKP really um, embraced the perceived glory of the Ottoman Empire but used uh, the Ottoman like history very selectively uh, and uh, this also if you're interested in this uh, Netflix also uh, is showing this episode and just we're now talking about like 45 minutes episodes they're like two on two hours and half an hour two, two hours episodes and it's really long but you know it just uh, spurred interest yeah, it's everywhere long. yeah <laughs> yeah, long, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, when and uh, especially after the Syrian civil war, uh, the AKP government deployed humanitarian aid as one of the soft power instruments. Um, Turkey hosted around three million five hundred uh, thousand uh, Syrian refugees. And uh, based on a deal with the European Union, uh, then special deal with the European Union, and uh, Turkey is really investing a lot, a lot of money on humanitarian aid in general as well. But after the uh, Syrian civil war, the AKP government very effectively used humanitarian aid as, as a political discourse, especially in relation to Europe, and depicts itself as the benevolent country, and it's also as part of its like neo ottoman uh, it aligns with its neo ottoman imperial vision as well uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> bilateral uh, cultural relations is not a new instrument turkey has been uh, having cultural relations since 1951 and the <coughs> minister of foreign affairs was the primary actor and in <coughs> addition to that, Minister of Culture and Tourism and Minister of National Education was also important actors in bilateral cultural relations. Um, and also national cultural institutions are important, uh, uh, important par partners. Uh, and in terms of arts exhibitions, uh, private institutions or non-governmental institutions also has uh, taking uh, some exhibitions abroad but Minister of Foreign Affairs or Minister of Culture and Tourism would like to <coughs> control the content of these exhibitions and how the nation is uh, depicted and in terms of historical exhibitions the Foreign Affairs uh, holds the right to organize and implement historical exhibitions abroad and does not allow the non-governmental institutions or private institutions uh, and, and it's like the intention to, is to control the uh, historical narrative. Um, <coughs> and it also deploys, uh, deploys Turkish airlines uh <coughs> as soft power instruments, like through increasing uh, the number of uh, des flight destinations. It's, it uh, ranks the first, I think, in the number of uh, destinations in the Middle East and Africa. And it aggressively uh, pursues like marketing strategies, and uh, we see that these also like soft power instruments aligns well with the AKP's neo-Ottomanist neo imperialist vision. And the more nation image is deteriorated, it just uh, deploys these instruments more intense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He wants it in his recording. It's not that we, oh. not that we can't hear you. It's okay. that the camera can't hear you. Not a particularly profound question, or, or just uh, about the BDS. Um, just. Um, do you think it's going to be 
effective? I know you've studied this in the context of the Eurovision, but generally, do you think that um, that it is gaining strength in Europe, and do you think that it will do do harm to Israel? And also related to that, I w- I'd be very curious to see if Turkey will go and send a, a, a team there and uh, how Erdogan will relate to this whole thing. May I Just speculation, I know, informed speculation. Yeah, I mean, Turkey, I can actually quickly answer that, that they're not participating today. They also haven't in a while, but they mainly, it's mainly a financial decision as far as I know, so it's not something that happens just this year. They haven't participated in the last few um, contests as well, if you, as far as I you know by any chance the Eurovision, <laughs> yeah. But so when it comes to the BDS, I think that it does, g- it, it is gaining traction mm-hmm. in, in Europe. And, you know, yes, we also talk mm-hmm. about, you know, like campuses and in, in, in the U.S. So there is some traction there. Um, but uh, it's much harder for the BDS movement to coalesce around a specific vision than it was for, like, the anti-apartheid you know, like movement, mm-hmm. and even that took decades, really, to to get to the point where where it was very well known and you know, like had a lot of high profile um, events or high profile uh, people who who boycotted, right? So, so I think that long term it's hard to say, but for now, um, I think there's there's a lot of people who are sort of aligning with <laughs> some of what the BDS movement does. You know, like maybe saying, okay, you know, like there are different levels there as well. The BDS movement demands a full boycott of economic and cultural and even academic, um, you know, like cooperation. While um, I think there's a more of these subcategories where people say, oh, like European Union starting to label um, products that come that are you know produced in settlements, right? But n- but still encourage academic and 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 other cooperation and things like that. So, but it's. I mean, the Israeli government seems to think that it w- that is doing damage, right? Like, ob- not publicly. Publicly, they're like, no, this is just a little thing, and I think that's probably m- more, you know, closer to reality. Um, but seeing how much money is being put into, and also, you know, the kind of restrictions that are being placed on individuals that align with the BDS movement, like the law that you know allows Israel to. You know, like to block people from entering the country if they are part of certain organizations. Uh, it seems that the Israeli government clearly thinks that it has the potential of of harming. Yeah. Thanks. Um, first, for um, uh, Professor Bailey's. Or do you, you have the Turkish Airlines and on the on the on the board here? And uh, interestingly, I uh, I, I uh, discovered that the Turkish Heritage Organization that I, I has been set up in in DC um, that throw great events, by the way, p- uh, panel conversations and 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 and, and whatnot, um, has a sponsor. Uh, the Turkish Airlines has a sponsor, and I was curious to know how that if you could break down uh, the more granular level, how the soft power. Um, um, uh, um, work in that in that in that context, right? For for the traditional uh, think tanks in DC, um, we cannot figure out AI. For example, we invite you know three conservative um, panelists and one liberal, right? And that's how the influence will work when you have a conservative think tank. But in the context of the um, the Turkish Heritage Organization, for example, with the sponsor like the Turkish Airline, how would that work? How much how much influence and and control over? The, the topics, the themes, and the, the participants in the e- events, in the programming, you know, they will have to 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 you know ma- materialize that soft power. And my second question was for um, um, Professor um, uh, Bailes. Sorry, that was for exactly Professor Bailes. When you mentioned on the, <laughs> I was like, wow, <laughs> um, the the good news reporting. Um, granted, on Al Jazeera and the CNN style, I was wondering if in your findings you found with the with the social media or the new media, any example of, of good news that 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 work right? I mean, uh, w- uh, that are non 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 traditional in the in the digital media um, form, whether it's the YouTube or Facebook uh, uh, platforms that you you would mention you would you know, uh, have as an example of a good news or potential good news. Thanks so much. 
are you asking in terms of like Unisemre cultural centers or in right, the, the main place is specifically Petrum, the Turkish Church organization has, has been set up uh, a few years ago. Um, and even Kali has already um, set some systems in part to deal with events from Turkish and Maroc writers who mm -hmm. are based in this site, who are specialized in doing their research study. Um, and, and, uh, and one of the specialized there is Turkish Horizon. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. In terms of scholarly uh, scholarly archives or mm -hmm. uh, programming uh, to uh, to be able to 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 decommercialize that that that, mm -hmm. that power in that organization or maybe yeah. to to be able to make it just controlling it yeah. and just controlling and, and and with no say on the programming. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not really aware of like the governance of the uh, programming that you have mentioned. Yeah. I think if we knew about how the governance is taken care of, I would comment. I would make a better command of it, but if like the foreign ministry or like the Ministry of Culture and Tourism just involved, uh, probably the cultural programming is under the auspices of the you know AKP government as well. Right. But I think we we better just need to know better about the governance yeah, structure. If I may add to that, it sounds like the question you're asking in a way, I would, again, I'm trying to introduce this term. The, the question you're asking is, I would phrase it, you, you might not, but I would phrase it, is Turkey using sharp power? Because this gets at the distinction between soft power, which is a term I've always abhorred, uh, and, and sharp power. Sharp power tends to, to sort of penetrate in somewhat deceptive ways have open forums that are really very politicized and tendentious. Every country does this to some degree. But when it's a deliberate policy, then the question of governance and how much the AKP, AKP is trying to skew and twist and, as the Chinese would say, align mm -hmm. these things with government intentions and government ideologies, that's when it starts to be sharp power. Um, now, your question for me was about social media and good journalism. Um, at their best, despite the word radio in the name of some of these uh, U.S. international services, they are very, they're very adept with social media. They're very adept with all media platforms, more than the commercial media, because they're trying to get into places like Moldova, you know, and uh, Macedonia, and Cambodia, and Nigeria, and places that don't end in IA, um, to deal with, to try to reach people who are not who are not going to be attractive to advertisers. So they're very innovative with their media. And if they had more money, more resources, they could do it even better. Um, so they are really using social media well. And people have learned, depending on the type of medium that's used in, more used in that country, in the group of people, they go to the, they can find Radio Free Asia in Cambodia. You can find it online if you happen to have a computer. Most people in Cambodia do not, or even a smartphone. Uh, so it's, it's integrated into these U.S. government efforts, but of course there's a universe outside that which they have to swim in. Right, well, I guess I have to Are we done? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they told me we had to stop. Okay. Um,